We made it happen. Jimmy was an incredible success. I don't know where he is. I gotta find him. Gosh, I don't. Oh, oh, oh. Oh yeah, George, George, oh, George, right George. Here. Yeah. Hey, we did it, brother. We, yes, we hey, did. Thanks to this, you know what? And in the ring with Dan and Drew, Benny. Hey, brother, man, hey, he's about the most cat. I just love him to death. I love you. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're the best. I'm telling you, brother. In the ring with Dan and Benny. Yeah, we love you. Thank Woo, you so much, Dan. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Dan and Benny in the Ring. I'm Dan Spash, and I'm joined, as always, by the player himself, Benny Scala. Benny, how you doing, buddy? Dan, I have to start by thanking everyone who listens to us as of this red-hot moment in time. We're actually charting in four different countries, United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Ireland. I think we're number 64 in the United States. So do I have to get a bar a catchphrase from the great Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. I like it. As a... Uh... Are Dan and Benny going to keep charting if I can quote the great L.A. Knight? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> let me talk to you. <laughs> well, you know, Benny, we always like to try to do something a little different here. I mean, we've had great runs. Uh, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up. When you pitch this idea of kind of interviewing an interviewer, it was one of those things we kind of bounced around. But we really want to do it because I think that we're going to get a lot of good stories tonight. So why don't you tell everybody who we got on the phone with us? Well, Dan, you know, this is episode number 151. So in the course of the 150 previous episodes, what do we have? We've had wrestlers. We've had children of wrestlers, referees, managers, commissioners, promoters, and writers, and maybe even a turnbuckle or two. But uh, tonight, and then this guy has also laced up the boots, and he's actually on his own promotion. But he's the first collector we have on our show. This is a really great guy, and I'm sure he's going to have a lot of great stories, like you said. So I am honored to welcome the Bud Father, Mr. Bud Carson. Mr. Carson, welcome to Dan and Benny in the Ring. Well, thanks, guys. It's glad to be on. Well, we appreciate you you having you, obviously. We appreciate your time, um, and we'll get right down to it. Uh, first question, this is kind of a question we start with for everyone, because every answer is different. We, we always love getting the different answers. Uh, so... For you, Bud, when did the uh, when did the wrestling bug bite you from a fan perspective? And do you remember who got you involved in in, in enjoying it? Well, I grew up in um, a small town in Pennsylvania called Stroudsburg, and we had moved to Allentown. And once we moved to Allentown, my dad started watching wrestling, and then uh, you know that's where it really bit me. And my brother, uh, I'll tell you a little story about him in a little bit, uh, but. The main guy back then was this this Puerto Rican guy named Victor Rivera. Oh yeah. And, oh, he had the drop kicks. He had the car. The abdominal stretch, the sentons. Right, you got it. He just he lightened my new world up, and of course, with having a brother, I tried my wrestling holds on him, and he hid his holds on me, and then the champ dad had to come in and beat the crap out of both of us. Right. But uh, yeah, he we we just loved it. Dick the Bulldog Brower, because uh, he, he was all crazy. And I, I, w- I really didn't discover Bruno San Martino until a little bit later. But, you know, it was Victor Rivera who got me hooked. So you're talking probably like 68, 69-ish, yeah. I want to guess. Is that Yeah, I started watching in 68. You know, and but on your website, you share a really great story about a place called Bookarama. Or, but yeah, Bookarama in, in downtown Allentown. And um, you're able to find old wrestling magazines for a, for a dime, I think you said. And I have a very similar story. So I grew up in Long Island, and every Saturday my parents would go to the farmers market. They had an Italian deli there, so they get the provolone, you know, the the pepperoni and stuff like that. Yeah, all the good stuff. And um, but and of course I didn't want to really hang out at the deli, so I wanted to you know look around. And I had just become a wrestling fan, you know, maybe a few months before that. And I went and I, I saw this old bookstore and I, they had a bunch of magazines, old magazines. And I started looking through the magazines. And here I find like found a wrestling review from, I think, 1959. And oh, right. It was like it was one of the first ones, actually. I found a wrestling review. I found wrestling world. 
I found the the ring back in I think it was called the ring wrestling. So I mean I definitely get it. Um, so after that I guess you became an avid collector. When did you when did you realize that you wanted to actually do this kind of as a living? I I not until I was already in the baseball card business. What I did and and going back to the the wrestling magazine thing was this place, Bookarama, had uh, a table. It was probably measured by eight foot by eight foot. And that whole table was filled with boxes of wrestling magazines. Oh, jeez. So I, what I would do, uh, go up and buy some wrestling magazines. Now, remember, I had a, I had a, uh, a um, paper route. I shoveled snow. I, I raked leaves. I cut lawns. I ran to the store for my neighbors. I was a hustler back yeah, then. Yeah, I say you, you hustled for that for that money. I hustled back then. And uh, my mom took care of everything but my sneakers. Now, I had to have good sneakers because I was an athlete. So I got the Converse All-Stars. Remember okay. those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So, and, and they were expensive at $8 a pair back then. Um, but, yeah, what I did, and then with the rest of my money, I bought baseball cards and wrestling magazines. Uh, a, a neat thing that a lot of people don't know about me was in the back of a lot of wrestling magazines, there were fan clubs. Do you remember those? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And right to the fan clubs. And I think it was the Ring magazine that they they gave you the address to the booking agencies of each territory. So I would write uh, them and uh, you know, get involved with the fan clubs and and in the magazines, every once in a while, you can find a full page uh, picture of them. Like, and I think Wrestling World had color pictures. They did. Yes, pictures. they did. And I would send them to the booking agencies and ask them to sign them. And uh, believe it or not, ninety percent of the stuff never came back. That's, right. That's another story. But every once in a while, uh, one would come back, and then. What I realized was these guys traveled a lot, and the wrestling magazines were always a month behind. But if you could send the right one to the right booking agency, like the Sheik, he was always up in Detroit, you know, because he ran Detroit. Uh, Eddie Graham ran Florida. They they would always write, you know, sign your stuff and send it back to you. Now back in that day too, stamps were only two cents, so you know, to go with the time. So what I did was I collected all these uh, wrestling photos that I ripped out of the magazines and I put them in scrapbooks. And uh, when I went into the Marine Corps, my mom never got rid of them. So you hear horror stories about mom getting rid of your baseball card. Oh, you're going to make me cry here. So yeah, I I get that. (laughs) But my mom didn't do that. When I got out of the Marines, all my stuff was nicely you know, in my closet. And uh, I didn't know till later on when I got into the baseball card business, and this was about 97, that wrestling started really taking off, the Attitude Era. So um, I started collecting, and I had all these old-time uh, autographs from, you know, sending them to the booking agencies and the fan clubs, and I held on to them, and I said, you know what, one day I'll break these out and sell them. And uh, that basically what I was doing was saving this stuff up for my retirement. Right. And now, and now it is working out the way I had planned it as a young, as a young man. It's always great when a plan works out. But let me ask you a quick follow-up question because I, now I bought my first wrestling magazine. I think it was in May of 1968. Now I had gotten a, a 12-inch Hitachi. Uh, color TV for the previous for my not color black and white little teeny Hitachi for my Christmas present and I brought it up to my room because my parents were tired of me hogging the the TV set for all the sports you know so I'm I'm going through the UHF dial on a Saturday night and I see on channel 47 from Newark New Jersey which was a Spanish station but they had Lucha Libre and I thought okay well I, at least I could watch it I can't really, lo and behold it was Ray Morgan. And it was the guys from the National Arena in Washington, D.C. But I remember when I bought my first magazine, the one thing I remember that most vividly is when I opened the magazine, there were people in there that, you know, like Sam Steamboat and Mark Lewin and and guys like that. And I thought, 
I, in my mind, all the wrestling was took place. What you know what, what, was what I watched. I had no idea there was other parts of the country that that did that. You know that had wrestling. Did you have a a similar experience? Well, when I got a wrestling magazine, I read it from cover to cover. I know more worthless things about old professional wrestling than I know what's going on now. But yeah, I I knew it. Um, like here was one of the experiences I had, and it's very similar to the one you have. I got a wrestling magazine, and there there was a match with this guy named Joe Scarpa. Ooh. And I was looking at him, and I was like, man, that looks like Chief J. Strong. Right. And then you know, and then later on, I realized, well, he, at, down in Georgia, he wrestled at yeah. Joe Scarpa. Long time. He mm-hmm. came up here, and actually, it was supposed to be a pun. For Jewel Strongbow out on the coast, they were right. Trying to the old announcer, him. yeah, yeah, and well, he was a promoter out in California. Oh, he's actually too. a promoter. That's right. Yeah, but he did he did the interviews. He did a lot, he did the locker right. room interviews yeah. too. Big guy, sort of like what Vince McMahon did. Right, you know? exactly. Uh, but it was supposed to be a pun on him, but it worked. I mean, Chief J Strongbow became one of the most popular wrestlers um, in the in the world ever. Number two babyface, yeah, and and other ones I could read uh, about a wrestler named Big Bob Windham, and I was like, man, that guy looks like Black Jack Mulligan. Later to find out it was. So then I discovered, well, these guys are wrestling all over the world, but using different names and right. different gimmicks, and it just that opened up a whole other world for me. Right. <laughs> it's funny. It's crazy how sometimes, you know, like uh, – We've had guests on before, Benny, where they've talked about either traveling or you just happen to get the right channel at the right time. And you're like, hey, that's, you know, who it's such a great world versus nowadays, you know, not only do I know who's under the mask or who's who, but I know when that they've signed a contract and are debuting in a month. So there's no surprises or like change the world changed a little bit. If if you watched wrestling as intently as I did, I didn't just watch it. I studied it. Like, I could tell, uh, like, a guy under a hood by the way his body is shaped. Right. Like, when when the mass executioners came in to the WWF in the mid-70s, I knew it was Keller Kowalski. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that one was, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Just by the way their bodies looked. And then, God forbid, Keller Kowalski do an interview, and that gave it away right there. Right, the accent. But yeah, I didn't just watch it; I studied it. The, the, like, like trying to figure out who Giant Machine was all these years later. Right, it's a yeah, that was a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you you initially you said you initially started uh, collectibles business. Um, you mentioned baseball cards before you got into wrestling. Um, I, I want to side question here you're benny and i are both hardcore baseball fans we talk about baseball on the show sometimes more than we do wrestling it feels like um i mean where you mentioned where you're from uh, pennsylvania i assume the phillies are your team uh is that correct and, and who's your all-time favorite yeah i'm i've always been a phillies fan but i and this sounds weird almost like a a, a, a magnetic polar thing but i've always been a mets fan too and uh I, I my favorite team is the phillies but my favorite baseball players of all time were daryl strawberry and mike piazza all right yeah. that's okay. interesting yeah that's brilliant well i'm an interesting guy kind of <laughs> weird i can I, I i can respect that i mean i still think when we, we've talked about it on the show before i still think daryl strawberry is top five for the prettiest swings just the oh, form yeah. of the swing. Pure swing, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there was yeah. something on Facebook that, you know, who was the greatest third baseman of all time? So, and, you know, it was probably split right down the middle, half Brooks, half, well, maybe not half, but I mean, you know, equal Schmidt and, and uh, Br- um, Brooks. Brooks and then maybe, yeah, maybe like a few for George Brett getting tongue tied here. But, and honestly, like, I can't, I mean, I think Brooks was the better defensive third baseman. But he wasn't a slouch at bat, and then right. I, Schmidt was a li- I, I think a shade behind, um, you know, as far as fielding with Brooks. But I think his his power kind of I, I I call that one a Broadway. I I couldn't pick either one of them. I yeah I I wouldn't pick between them. 
That's exactly what you said. Brooks was like a vacuum cleaner over there. Oh, God. But, no, you yeah. Know, you got to remember, Schmidt had uh, 10 gold gloves himself. Yeah, yeah he was in a slouch. Mm-hmm. No. To slouch at. But he had a, a potent bat. And you got to remember this, too. Schmidt played in a dungeon. Veteran Stadium was a dungeon. And uh, a lot of a lot of things, um, like it was uh, the field itself was concrete covered by AstroTurf. So when a ball got hit on the ground, it jetted through the infield, whereas on natural gla- grass, it, it's a lot slower. So you take all that into, con- into consideration, and uh, Schmidt was just as good as Brooks, but had a little more power and um but I I wouldn't bat a lash at either of those guys. Right. You know, right. I think Schmidt was actually the first ball player to make over $2 million a year. I, I, I want to say it was 1985. Like, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but, I mean, compared to what these guys are making now, it's just, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. I Like, a guy like Schmidt, what the heck would he make, right, in, in you know, in this day and age? With the Bryce Harper He's yeah, got to be, like, part owner, I'm thinking. Well, if he, if he played – at Citizens Bank Park, you can almost guarantee he'd have 50 to 100 more home runs. Right. Mm-hmm. Plus the fact of what I said, he wasn't playing on concrete, which was hard on the knees. Yeah. He probably could have got five or six more seasons out of it if he played his whole career there. Well, you argue the problem the, uh... with Citizens Bank Park is it's so small, they're always swinging for defenses. And they strike out a lot. <laughs> There you go. They didn't make it to the World Series this year. Right. right. Well, you, you could argue, I mean, uh, maybe not with the with the new left field wall, the way it's set up. But if if Brooks had played a few years in Camden Yards, he probably would have pat, patted his batting stats a little bit. First, sure. for, you know, early years of that state before, like I said, before they moved the, the left field wall, that was a home run, home run dream park. Yeah. Look at the guys Brooks played with, too. Yeah, Mike Robinson and Boog Powell and and uh, Ellie Hendricks. Well, the, I mean, seventy two. You, Benny and I, we've talked about it before. You'll never, ever again in baseball history get that get get tw- four twenty game winners in the same team. How about it? You don't. What a uh, what a pitching staff it's that was. Right, rare yeah. just to get one twenty game winner these days. I mean, any any, any one of those guys was McNally, Palmer, was it uh, Dobson and Quayar mm-hmm. would be like twenty five million dollar pitchers nowadays. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah. Well, the, the the way the way the uh, Angelos boys sign their payroll, uh, Brooks wouldn't be in Baltimore. He'd be making thirty million a year, probably with the Yankees or something. Yeah, somewhere or else. The Dodgers, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but in in preparation for this interview, I I try to listen to a few of yours, and um, you and I share having Bruno San Martino as your, I would say, your all-time favorite wrestler. So, but Bruno became more than, I mean, you became more than just a, a fan of Bruno's. You became a very a very close friend of his. I'd, I'd like to hear how that all happened. Okay. Um, I don't forget what year it was, but it was, it was, I think it was 1999 that we had our first store open, and I went up to Queens, New York, to Jack Balance store. You know Jack? The wrestling universe? Yes. Okay, yeah. We went up to Jack Balance store to meet Bruno and uh I I had an opportunity to spend some time with him and then I talked to the guy who was agenting him at that time about bringing him to my store. So uh we we brought Bruno in on it was Super Bowl Sunday ninety nine and I thought, well, Nothing happens during the day. The Super Bowl ain't until 6.30. Bruno will be back home by 6.30 anyway. So uh, we brought him in. We had a really good crowd. And, uh, you know, he signed a bunch of stuff for me. And he just loved the old wrestling magazines. Uh, the ones, I, and I, one in particular that he was on with a guy named Hans Mortier. Oh, God. You're, now you're really bringing back good memories. Yeah, you're you're going back to 66 or so. Right. So he signed a bunch of magazines for me, and as we we parted, and he, you know, uh, got ready to drive away, I felt a genuine, um, I don't know, a, a feeling about him. Um, not just the fact that he was my wrestling guy, but just a, a warm feeling, a humble feeling, 
and the way he treated the, the fans that came to see him was was a lesson for me on how to treat wrestling fans. Now, if you've been around wrestling fans long enough, you know none of them are all um, rocket scientists. Dan, what do you always say? The, the, the best of people and the worst of people? Yeah, re- wrestling fans are simultaneously the best and worst people on Earth. You could say something like that. But he, he treated everybody with, with respect and, and that. And I said, well, that's what I want to do. I, I want to treat people like that. So um, about six months later, a friend of mine went to a show in um, – I remember it was called Skyland Park. It was in New Jersey somewhere. And uh, I had a couple more wrestling magazines and Bruno sitting there signing autographs and stuff. And I lay my wrestling magazines down and he looks up, he goes, bud, what are you doing here? And just the fact that Bruno remembered me. Like this is Bruno San Martino, right? right? Yeah. This is like the goat, the greatest of all time remembered me. And I was like, wow, like chills went down my spine. So then, then on, I, I, I talked to him for a little while because uh, it was towards the end of the autograph signing. And, and I asked him, I said, would it be okay for me to send you some stuff? And he goes, but you can send me anything you want at any time you want. Just, uh, you know, here's my address and, you know, um, and we exchanged phone numbers and all this other stuff. But I, uh, and I did send him a lot of stuff from time to time, but the one thing I always did with Bruno was I would write him a letter, old school style, and ask permission to send stuff out, and then he would call me on the phone. So I would like would be down here in my office working on something, and he would call, and Cindy, my wife, would answer the phone, and then she yelled down the steps here, "Hey, Bud, Bruno San Martino's on the phone for you." How many people get that? You know <laughs> did I mean? you feel, did you feel like you were twelve years old again, like? Yeah. So over the years, whenever he appeared at a show or something, I'd make sure that I, I got over to spend a little time with him and, and talk with him. And he would always ask about my family because he got to meet my family and everything. And a genuinely nice guy, you know. But I I think what really um, connected us with was my love and respect for old school wrestling and whereas at the time that I I met him was was turning into the Attitude Era, uh, which was not his cup of tea. Right. Yeah. It, it, it was you know the women with their boobs hanging out and oh uh, I wouldn't say hanging out but you know the, the women wrestlers became very sexy you know Sable Sunny. Right. The the Divas Era. The divas there and Stone Cold with his beer drinking and cussing and uh, you know so it wasn't his cup of tea and it really wasn't mine either but that was the era that I got started in the wrestling part of my business and I, truthfully if it wasn't for Vince McMahon and uh, you know the Hulk Hogan time we wouldn't be doing this stuff. Because before that, there was like wrestling magazines and posters you could get off telephone poles and stuff like that. But really not a whole lot of wrestling collectibles. Wow. I, I got to say something, bud. You know, in, in my life, there was two people. And when I'm, ta- I'm talking about like back when I was probably a teenager, the two people I wanted to meet were Gary Puckett, you know, from Gary Puckett and the Union Gap and, yes. and, uh, and Bruno. And as it turned out, I met both of them. And you know how they say... You know, be careful. You know, you, your heroes might disappoint you. And right. they were two of the nicest, most humble, I mean, people that I have ever met in my life. I, I had Christmas dinner with Bruno in 2016. This is last Christmas at uh, Rico's in, uh, in, you know, in Pittsburgh. And I was like probably five feet away from him. I was across the table from his wife. Um, and then Dominic was, I sat next to Dominic Danucci. Donnie Iris was there, you know, from, uh, from the Jaggers. But I mean, you describe. You would never know if you if you were having dinner with Bruno. You would think he was your uncle or something. You would never know that he was probably like the greatest wrestler, not probably the greatest wrestler of all time, and and a hero to millions because he never acted that way. And he genuinely, genuinely appreciated every fan like it was his only fan. I had to say that. Right. Yep, yep. And even when and I've learned this over the years too. People would 
uh, come in and give false information because they didn't know. They, you know, it was like, uh, and then Bruno was like, oh, well, thank you very much for that. You know, like uh, he might, uh, somebody might have said, well, I saw you wrestle, um, I don't know, Hulk Hogan at, you know, a high school gym in New Jersey, and that never happened. But Bruno was like, well, thank you very much for that. Yeah. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. You know, never, you know, correct someone or, or make them feel less than. Just go with the flow. Right. And right. I've learned that too over the years. If wrestling fans want to, you know, say that they know this or they know that, I say, well, so you're a really smart guy, you know, even though I know they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, you got you got to put them over, right? Right. Yeah, you got to put them over, and, and because you, you you want them to come back, whether they got their information right or not, you still want them to come back and right. and you know be your friend. It's good customer service. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you don't want to upset people for no reason. Well, you've it's not over wrestling anyway. Right. <laughs> right. You 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 talked. To, you know. You you, you mentioned. The, the the popularity the transition the mid 90s so we we're looking back you've got uh the sports card collectibles and then can you kind of walk us through because i wish you to expand a little bit on, on some of what you've been saying the official like what what was the process the transition from carson sports card collectibles to pro wrestling world okay um we had a store on uh it was chapel avenue that was over on the south side island town and at that time, this is when Stone, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin came on. Now, Stone Cold Steve Austin was what we remember as a heel type guy. Remember? Mm-hmm. Uh, like a Stan Hansen type guy, mm-hmm. a rough talking guy. He was supposed to be a heel. But what happened is the fans turned him, him into a baby face. And he was the big phenomenon at that time. So uh, me being a wrestling fan, I had a couple Stone Cold Steve Austin um, action figures in my store. And then pretty soon it was like, okay, can you get me this? Can you get me that? Can you, you know, and then more requests for wrestling items came in. And then I was like, wow, I mean, I'm selling more wrestling stuff than I am sports cards. Maybe we should start looking into this and... uh, you know, maybe switch up. I mean, I don't want to totally get out of sports cards because I really love it. I still do to this day. But the wrestling was a more profitable business at that time. So, and that's when we, you know, we met Bruno San Martino for the first time that during that era. And uh, he was our very first autograph signing at the store. Well, anywhere. And then it, it was very successful. And then from then on, people found out that uh, I hosted wrestling autograph signings. And then other agents would, you know, give me a call and say, hey, I got the Bushwhackers in town. Do you want to, you know, use the Bushwhackers? And then it just kept rolling. And uh, pretty soon I said, you know, we, we might as well just get in the wrestling business. You know, and I had put some wrestling stuff uh, away, like I said, the the scrapbooks and those little, remember those little leather autograph books that had about 100 pages in them? Uh, You can get people to sign them, and that I I had a bunch of those, too, and then uh, my collection of wrestling magazines, and, and even back then, it was easier to find wrestling stuff than the LJNs were, were out, the Hasbro's. And the the Jacks figures were just coming out, and they were really hot. So we said, okay, uh, let's get into the wrestling business and put the sports cards on hold for a while, and it, we just really never went back. Good, perfect segue, uh, but because you mentioned that Bruno was your first guest. But I, I'm sure there's a list as long as uh, Chris Jericho's list of 1,004 wrestling holes. Um, oh who, if you if you can say, uh, you know, who are some of your favorites and maybe like without saying names, you know, unless you want to say names, but, uh, you know, instances where people were wrestlers were, were less than professional. And do you have I mean, obviously, Bruno probably would be your favorite, but I know you mentioned Paul London. So maybe yeah. like you at the end of the, what, your answer, you could bring Paul Paul up and what a what a great guest he was as well. OK, well, my as you know. My thing was always 
bring the legends in. We've had um, Bruno, George Steele, Chief J. Strongbow twice, um, Harley Race, Nick Bockwinkle. You know, we, we've had almost every legend there was. That was actually affordable. And I would say 90% of them guys were very highly professional, and they knew what they were doing. Um, one, of the, one of these cool stories I wanted to tell you guys is we did a signing with Alundra Blaze. Remember her? Medusa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Medusa, yep. And I had a lot of stuff for her to sign. And my philosophy was always, I'm paying you to sign autographs. That's what I want you to do. And they know that because I talked to them before they would come in. And, she, you know, she she was like, whatever. And, and she came in, and I had a lot of stuff for her to sign. And, and she said to me, you know, I get paid to sign autographs. That's what I want to do. What else do you got? And I was, like, impressed with her because that's, you know – uh, a lot of wrestlers want to come in and just sit there and talk and not sign nothing. Right. But I'm not making any money if they're not signing. For right. Them. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't like to push them, but you know, sometimes, you know, you got to give them a little nudge and say, Hey, you got a whole lot of stuff here to sign. Let's get going. J- just for, was, uh, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and then there was another time where I was doing a signing with uh, Bill Eady, who was a uh, demolition ax the mass superstar, yeah, superstar and right. a couple other gimmicks. And uh, he he was signing some really cool stuff for me. And he goes to me, he goes, you know, when I'm dead, this stuff's going to be worth some money. <laughs> and I was like, well, I never said that to any wrestler signing stuff. He said it to me. But there is a time when the wrestlers pass that their stuff gets hot for about three days. And then yep. it goes back to normal. Wow, that's so, interesting. Yeah, and, and if you're smart, you'll prepare for it, especially with these old guys. You know, that, I mean, you got guys like right now, like, say, Ken Patera and Ivan Putski. They're getting up there in age. And, they're, yeah, early 80s. It, but Ken just turned that, 80. Yeah. Yeah. And the ones that surprise you with that are the young guys, like when Kurt Henning died. I mean, who, whoever thought that was going to happen? Right. You know, uh, but... It is what it is, and, and if if you're in this business for as long as I have, you know, you know the the system, on you know when to sell stuff, when not to sell stuff, what to get signed, what not to get signed, and uh, I, I've done quite well with that. Um, one of the bad people that came in, one guy who's from the Philadelphia area, came in drunk one time, and we had to keep waking him up so he could, you know. Sign for the fans. Wow. We've had guys that came in and they didn't want to sign nothing. You know, they just, I mean, I paid them good money to sign stuff and they just didn't want to sign nothing. Um, and other guys that, uh, you know, they were grumpy when they came in. Maybe their wives didn't give them nothing that day or something like that. Jesus. But 90% of the guys that came in were very professional and, um, I can say overall, we did very well. And But then there was Paul London, the best guy we ever had in there. He didn't draw as well because he was just just out of the WWE. And as, as far as I want to say, there wasn't a lot of him for him and Kendrick. They were a tag team, remember? Yes. Brian Kendrick? Mm-hmm. Yep. They were a good tag team, but there wasn't very many good opponents for them to really, to really shine at that time. Um, I seen Kendrick's in London wrestle the Young Bucks down at Philadelphia one time. Oh, okay. Dude, that match blew my mind. They were so good. So I had a, a whole new respect for for Paul London and Brian Kendrick because everybody knew how good the Young Bucks were. Yeah. I don't even know where the Young Bucks are now. AEW now they're... Are they? Uh, right, Dan? Yes. It. Yep. Or is it Matt Hardy calls them the Bucks of Youth. Yeah. <laughs> the Cucamonga Kids is my favorite nickname for them. So, yes. Yeah, Paul London was absolutely great, but we've had other really good guests. Now, something I've always done too, now, I don't think you guys have ever been to my museum, but when I would ask someone to come in to do a signing with me, I would ask them if there's anything that they'd like to donate to the museum or loan to the museum. 
and uh, we'd put it in a showcase and show it off until they wanted it back. So we got a lot of neat stuff in there, and uh, most of the time they would just give it to me because they knew what I was building there. Back to Bruno San Martino, when Bruno did his second signing at the store with me, at that time we were just getting started with the museum. Now, Bruno was always against Hall of Fames because there was no brick-and-mortar Hall of Fame. Even the WWE Hall of Fame right now is a paper Hall of Fame. It's, yeah. It, it, now, if Vince would open up a, a brick-and-mortar museum, he could make a lot of money. I, I agree. Yep. Now, I, I'll get to that in a minute. But we had a showcase with some Bruno stuff in it, some pictures on the wall of Bruno. And then Bruno goes, this is what I'm talking about, bud. This is, you know, this is a Hall of Fame, you know, and Bruno loved it that, you know, we honored him like that. Now, if Vince would do the same thing down in Orlando, now think about it. You drop your family off at Disney and you go over to the WWE Hall of Fame for the day. Yeah, that's a moneymaker. Have a nice restaurant there right. or bar or something. Yeah, you, yeah, I would never leave. Yeah, that's part of the reason I think they had um, a lot of fans expected if they ever did it, it would end up in like an Orlando or somewhere, you know, where you you would make it part of your trip and not right. put it in the middle. You know, if they were to put it up in Connecticut, like not you wouldn't get as much foot traffic. No. Right, right. If you have it down in Orlando like with Disney down there, you can't go wrong. Right. I think that's why Hulk Hogan has his his store down there. Makes sense to me. Oh yeah. No, it's 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 funny because um, I think about especially uh, you know you, you look at some of the specials they've done the um, the hidden treasures or the backstage yeah. or we've had guests on that have have been there when you go to the actual warehouse and and the storage facilities that the WWE has and they've got you know the caskets the Undertaker's used for entrances and they've got various outfits and props and and stuff going back decades and it's like i mean you you have you know some the, the a car from you know the honky tonk man used in his music video oh, or, yeah, or the yeah. you know uh, an outfit randy savage wore at wrestlemania sitting in a box in a warehouse I that know. no one will ever see or touch right right and that's what that's what kind of made me disturbed when i was watching that hidden treasures thing now I had I had gotten a phone call from one of the secretaries to come here to my house to look at some of my stuff and I said no I I'm a very private person I don't want people coming to my house um but had they asked me that when I had my museum museum open uh I'm more than glad to do that you know come over and look for some treasures or you know just be on TV and get some of that exposure but I don't want people coming to my house and rooting through my stuff. Yeah, understand. You know, I, I got some treasures, but I'm not letting anybody know about it. No, I, I can get I get that. Yeah. You, you, you know, Benny mentioned that the during your intro, um, you, your your many hats, as we like to say, and besides pro wrestling world, you were the creator and owner of uh, Lay Valley Wrestling. Um, yeah. Can you kind of tell our listeners the the joys, the you know the the good and bad, the, I guess the joys and headaches, if you were, that comes with uh, running your own wrestling promotion? Okay, um, running a wrestling promotion for me is is about professional wrestling itself is about two main things: one, good characters, interesting characters, and two, interesting stories. That's why I love the wrestling magazine so much because of the interesting stories. Um, and and if, if you were a collector of wrestling magazines, you know there was different type of, of uh, wrestling stories in there. You had the investigative stories and then you had like the Bill Apter mags, which yeah. were more like <laughs> science fiction. <creative. laughs> yeah, they were the comic books for wrestling. Fans. Yes. And both enjoyable in the way. So, Building a wrestling federation now, and there's a difference between wrestling federations and running shows. Federations are storylines that continue from month to month. And what it's like is, is like you're a movie producer and you're watching your movie unfold. 
you you're watching the characters in a good movie unfold into and it and it builds up to the climax of of the uh main event you know like i could take you two guys and i'll start you off in a little feud um let let's let's say you remember how the iron sheik and sergeant slaughter started their feud one was leaving the ring, one was entering the ring. Yes, one guy told said, the yeah. other guy to move out of the way, and pretty soon, uh, two months later, they're in a, a in a boot camp match or whatever match they had. See, and it's building that story up. That that's fascinating. And as as a uh, promoter of a wrestling federation, you're watching that story unfold like a soap opera. And if it goes as well as you want it to well, you can sit back and say, yeah, that was pretty good. That feud was pretty good. That story was good. You know, and it and it comes from watching wrestling for so many years. Wrestling, not sports entertainment, but watching wrestling for all those years and reading all those wrestling magazines that you could develop that, that uh, movie type thing. So you got me as the promoter and then I got a right hand man who uh is a director you know and he'll I'll I'll give the stories to him and then he'll advise the wrestlers on how to do it you know um this is what Bud expects from you tonight um you guys go in you got 15 minutes um you know and then it, it comes it's like producing a movie and when you when it goes right it's a it's a great movie. It's an Academy Award. Maybe not to the wrestling public, but to you, it's a personal Academy Award. Some of the downfalls of that is it's very expensive. If um, if you don't have the right things, like it, it, you got to rent the hall, you have to rent a ring. I had my own ring, and I had all all the the uh, lights and chairs and uh, rails and everything. So. But that was an investment in the first place. That was very expensive. Um, you got to pay the wrestlers, um, you know, especially the superstars. If you bring some superstars in, like we had Honky Tonk Man come in, and uh, a lot of other local stars that made it big came in and wrestled for us. So, I mean, the cost of of running shows is is expensive. And then sometimes you have to deal with the egos of the wrestlers. Now, in my federation, I always try to teach the guys, let's build the foundation first. It's like building anything. You got to build the foundation first. Then we'll start elaborating into more uh, what you see on television. But until we do that, we have to establish ourselves as a wrestling organization. Then we'll go from there. And a lot of the young kids had egos, and they wanted to do what Chris Jericho was doing, or they wanted to do what Rey Mysterio does, but we're not ready for that yet. All right, baby we'll steps. Mm -hmm. One of the rules I had was, if you have a good idea, you got 30 days from one show to the next. Get a hold of me, take me out for lunch or a cup of coffee, and tell me what you want to do. And if I like it, I might tweak it a little bit, but then we'll go with it. And the other thing the young kids didn't understand but complained about was politics. Well, geez, I mean, if you get tight with the promoter and do what the promoter asks you to do, he's going to give you a push. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're a wrestler and you say, and my, my system was very simple. My system was, I'll give you a dollar for every ticket you sell to come in. You know, and say you sell 40 tickets, I'm going to give you $40. Plus, you're going to get 1% of the gate. So not only are you making a dollar per ticket, but you're raising the gate. Right, right. If you're smart about it, you'll get some 8 by 10s made up, and at intermission, you'll sell some 8 by 10s But here's the main thing. You get the wrestle. You get the wrestle, and that's what you love to do. You can come out of there with $100 for for a night's work you just have to follow the system right but a lot That's of young it. kids don't want to do that they want to wait till the last minute show up the day of the show and say hey bud i'd like to do this tonight 
wait a minute. No, I already have you doing something else. Why didn't you contact me during the week or during the whole month? Well, I got busy. Well, I, I can't do nothing about that. You, you, I need time to, you know, mull over what you want to do. Plus, the day of the show, I'm too busy. It's it's just too much work the day of the show to listen to some young kid say, hey, bud, I want to do this, or, you know, I think it's a good idea if I do that, or I want to go in this direction. Well, get a hold of me during the month and take me out for a cup right. of coffee. I'll listen to you. Yeah. So, so, Bud, this is the question that I wanted to ask you all night. We've both been fans since the late 60s. Um, how in your mind has wrestling evolved in the, in the past 50 so or so years? I, I was listening to Vince Russo uh, last week, and he had a very good analogy, at least in my opinion. You know, he said back in the day, you know, when we were kids, like, let's just use Victor Rivera against Toro Tanaka uh, as Ooh. a match. And, yeah, because it was something I've seen myself many, many times, but... He said in, that was two workers who were working together to work you as a fan into believing that they were legitimately fighting, a- as opposed to now where, I mean, he's, he, the expression he uses, it's a bunch of guys getting their shit in. And I, I posted something on Facebook last night. I said, when did, when did wrestling become a sing-along? Because I try to watch Monday Night Raw, and between Seth Rollins' theme song, Cody's, and uh, Sami Zayn's, it sounded like sing along with Mitch. Like I, I never, I don't remember going to a wrestling match thinking I'm going to have fun. I remember going to a wrestling match thinking, man, Bruno's going to face Tanaka. I mean, I was yeah. nervous. I'm thinking like the champ might lose his title tonight. So, do you agree with with Russo's assessment of what it's become? Well, I'm a good friend with Vince, and he's a Christian brother of mine. And yes, I agree with him 100. percent I don't know when it it became what it has become but one of the things that has disturbed me the most in today's wrestling is um the way that the new the new system is that they use finishers from years ago in the beginning of the matches like i'll give you an example someone will ddt somebody else in the middle of the in the beginning of the match and get right up and then go up to the top turnbuckle and do a 360 yeah. swap. No, su- no sell it. No, it. Not at all. Jake the Snake Roberts is prob- probably puking thinking about that. And, and if you think about it, the way Jake did it, he drove your head into the mat. It's over. It's over. Unless you were Superman or something, you, you weren't getting up for right. that. So these kids do this and and they just roll right out of it and keep going. And what you just said, no sale, no sale. There is, it's it's very fast now. It's it, it's no substance to it. Um, it's it seems like they just want to they they, they want to outdo themselves. Um, I I don't even know how to explain it, but I'll give you a story how I can put it together for you. Um, there's a town about 45 minutes away from here. It's called Pottstown. It's oh, yeah. Down, down near Philly. You heard of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we used to go to this show down there. And again, I won't throw anybody under the table. But the first time I went down, there, I seen this tag team. And they were great. Well, they did some moves that, that were really good. So I thought, oh, wow, I like these guys. So the second time I went down there, I said, Oh, man, these guys did the same thing they did last show. Third time I went down there, I said, these guys suck. Yeah. We're watching the same stuff over and over again. Right. And on TV, you're watching the same the, the same stuff. You're seeing 350-pound guys jumping over the top rope. I mean, that's that's not that's not believable in wrestling, in sports entertainment, which I really don't understand as much. But it's just, it's not believable. The characters aren't that good anymore. Um, it's too fast. You know, what, how Victor Rivera and Toro Tanaka can go 20 minutes is because they knew how to, to work the crowd. They knew how to give each other rest holds. Um, say Victor was tired because he didn't get enough to sleep last night. Well, he needed a break. Toro Tanaka would throw him out of the ring 
and then they would play the referee thing. You know, at the eight count, Toro would come over, and then the referee would have to start the count all over again. Gave Victor time to recuperate outside the ring. This was genius stuff back then. Sure. And they had this so fast, it's, it's, you can't keep up with it. I went to an indie show about two months ago, and the first match of the night was a very good match. However, I counted 64 chops, 64 chops in that one match. And by the time me and my friend Jeff, who went down with me, uh, we stopped counting at about intermission. There was 104 chops Yikes. on that Jeez. show. It's like, can't these guys wrestle? Why? why what's with the chops? I mean, it's a Rick, Rick Flair, Wahoo McDaniels type chops. You know, it's like, and of, of course the fans went woo every time they chopped. But <laughs> I, it was just, it's it's changed so much, and there's no substance to it. But I, I got to ask you another, and then just your opinion on this as well. And this is my opinion. Oh, you know, all back, this back is my opinion, brother. <laughs> back in the day, you know, we, we would see like we'd see I don't know maybe like a Mulligan, you know, or a Von Raschke come into the WWF. You know, they'd stay for six to nine months, they'd leave. You know, or Ray Stevens would come in now or then. But I think part of the problem now, and the reason why the ratings are so low, is that there are no territories where, like, I mean, these guys can't really go away. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, there's, there's no place yeah. else they can go. So we're seeing these guys week after week, month after month, year after year, and it just gets stale. I mean, how many different combinations can you have of these guys? And I think that's a problem is that I think part of the novelty of wrestling is that you, you have to go away for a bit and then you come back fresh. Maybe you come back as a new character or whatever it is. But um, do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Randy Orton. Let's just pick on Randy Orton for a little bit. The guy's been in the Federation for over 20 years. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He came in with a group of guys. Uh, I think John Cena was one of the guys he came in with. Um, and this was 20 years ago, but Randy yeah, the, fa the famous OVW class. Yeah. The O the OVW guys, they were all in OVW together. Yep. And, um, it, and you know, Randy, fantastic wrestler. No, you can't deny it, but how long are we going to watch Randy Orton before we get sick of him? Right. John Cena was the same way. John Cena never lost. I mean, even to a point where I was watching a match one time. It was him and Rusev. Rusev was the undefeated United States champion, which was a great story. Here you got this Russian guy, which he really wasn't Russian, but as far as the fans knew, he was Russian, with the United States title, and he was undefeated. Along comes John Cena, a former world champion, and takes the title from him. And say, well, what sense did this make? I mean, a world champ. It's a step down for John Cena, but they they killed the gimmick. Yeah. They they and and John Cena had been around. What what is he like a sixteen time champion too? Yeah. Something like that. Anyway, he is, yeah. I mean, how long are these guys gonna stick around and and bore the crap out of us? You know now, what you were saying back in the day. Here's a good one. A lot of people don't realize. Ken Patera was the Intercontinental Champion and the Missouri Champion. Right, won it four days apart. Yes, sir. Yeah, and and that that's something because he had to travel back and forth from New York to uh, St. Louis. St. Louis, yep. And, and you know that took a lot. You know, yeah, I don't know. Never if happened you've now. You've been on a plane a lot, but you know that takes a lot out of you. But it, it was it was nice to know that Patera can come into a territory. And then you wouldn't see him for two years. And he'd show up two years later, and he's fresh. He had places you know? to go. He had other places to go where they don't they don't have that anymore. Yeah, you had Vern's uh, Vern's AWA. You had all the NWA territories. All the territories, yeah. And you had Hawaii. I mean, you, you know, you could make money in all those places. And now it's pretty much, you know, WWE, AEW. If you want to go that route. Uh, most of the guys from the WWE head over to Japan for a, a short while and then come back and and hook up with AEW and, unfortunately, TNA, which I don't even know what they're doing anymore. 
But yeah, it was so much better back then. So the guys would come in fresh, and and here's something neat that only us old school fans would remember: that Say Patera would come into the territory. The first guy he would beat up would be Frankie Williams. Yep. And then Johnny right. Rivera, then SD Jones. So he would be climbing up the ladder. Right, and then maybe a Danucci after that. Like yeah, then, then it's then Danucci it's getting serious. Then, yeah. Yeah, and then then something he he'd get a nice run with the champion, and then maybe when he was done with the champion, take a step back and do a match with Danucci. Then he was out of the territory. Right, he'd go back down yeah, a little bit. Yeah, right, it, exactly. It was so good back then, like very that. formulaic, but it worked. Yeah, it did. And it did work. It worked very well. Um, one of the things that I was uh, I get appalled by, and unfortunately this happened to one of my favorite lady wrestlers, Gail Kim, her first night in the WWE, she won the woman's title. Now, for me, that sucks because what about all those women that were already there? They're waiting for their title shots or right. waiting for that, that little run as champion, which for the rest of their lives, they can say they were a WWE world champion and... Gail comes in and wins it the first night she's there. You know, that's is it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it could be uh it could always be worse if you remember they did the uh the Miss the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal and Gail Kim eliminated herself and walked out of the match because uh Santino Morella as a woman oh, like yeah, in yeah. drag was was booked to win it. You had past and present female stars from 15 years and your Miss WrestleMania was a man for yeah. for a, a simple gimmick joke. Yeah, and and why joke on them women? They work as hard as the men. Yeah, and in cases like a, a two years, what two out of the last three years, Charlotte and Rhea were was the best match at Mania. Like I would right. argue, the best, at least the best match of the, of the night they were on. You know, it, not not just as hard. In some cases, women are better than some of the men that you've got. Oh, yeah. Charlotte Flair is like one of the best wrestlers, female or male, in the in the business today. Yeah. You know? And I, I mean, about Ray, Ray Ripley, I don't I haven't seen her. I like her look, though. I would yeah. I would argue, you know, I follow the modern product. She's one of the biggest stars, not just in reaction and talent, but in the way she's presented that the company has, period. Like she's yeah. she's going to be one of the ones that you know headline shows for years to come if she oh, yeah. wants to. She she's the real deal for sure. You're you know, talking about Ray Ripley. Yeah, I I yeah. actually I think it's interesting something you mentioned earlier. You talked about you know how's the old the old saying I can't miss you if you won't go away. Um, the WWE just had a pay per view. Well, excuse me, what do they call them now? Premium live events at, at out yeah, in Saudi yeah. Arabia a couple weeks ago and. John Cena was he wrestled there. He's he's hey he had a mini comeback during the uh, the actors strike, and they mentioned I didn't even think about it. They mentioned on the show when he because he lost um, to Solo Sokoa, who's the up, young upcoming Samoan bulldozer. Um, that that John Cena hasn't had a a singles match win on pay per view since 2018. Now he's had tag matches. But like he's been the guy you, you bring in, you know, once or twice a year to, to put over whoever you're, you're trying to push Roman solo, you know, uh, he, he, he gave the rub to Cody and L.A. Knight, guys like that. And I think that works, you know, as that was a kind of a, a good system. But <clears throat> but well, as we used to be back in the olden days, too. right at they, they, the older guys would put the younger guys over. Yeah, as we uh, as we we get ready, Benny, um, you know, time just flies by when we do the show. Uh, final, as we get ready to wrap up, uh, final thoughts and uh, final thoughts to you, or final question to you, excuse me. Um, yeah, well, Bud. I wanted I wanted Bud to talk about um, the the Budfather Collectibles website that he has now. Oh, well, what what that became? It's just kind of really neat. I'm a big fan of the Godfathers. And uh, when I was over, when I had my last store, the one that, that I retired from, I, I had a Godfather T-shirt over my chair that I, I always sat in. I wouldn't let anybody sit in my chair. Kind of like the Archie Bunker thing. You yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine, Terrence Brennan, 
and he ran, um, used to run Legends of the Ring. And he came into one day and he goes, what are you, the Bud Father? And I thought, yeah, why that not? Works. Yeah. Yeah, my name's Bud and I love the Godfather. So when the Godfather turned 50, that was like last year or the year before 2022, that. I think, yeah. So I decided, I said, you know, let's have some fun with this. Let's let's uh, open open this website called the Bud Father uh, Collectibles, and I'll put all my really good stuff up there. And it's a little expensive, but you know, there's a lot <laughs> of really good stuff up there, and it's like a walk through history, really. Uh, more than you know, I, of course, I'd like to sell stuff, but I like the people just to go in there and look at some of the neat stuff I have, and uh, it's like going online museum, you know. Um, so it, I mean, it, even if you do want to buy something and you don't like the prices, you can always get a hold of me and make me an offer. I can't refuse, <laughs> you know, but it's just something I did, did for fun. I still got my eBay store, which we do very well with, but, uh, the Bud Father thing was just for fun. Nice. Nice. Well, but as we, uh, like I said, as we get ready to wrap up, um, I know you've got, your store, you've got your storefront, you post a lot on social media, uh, different eBay links and things like that. So, uh, final, final statement to you to promote, promote yourself, your stuff, where, where can people find the, your collectibles and, and your shop and storefront and everything? Well, I don't really don't have a storefront no more. I shut that down years ago, but you'll see me at the conventions. I'm always at the icons conventions and, um, the other ones uh, in in our area. I don't really like to travel too much out of the Philadelphia, New York area, but you'll see me there, and I'm online with the Bud Father Collectibles and the eBay store, and and we do good with both of them. So I really don't have to hustle like I did years ago. I'm just sitting back and enjoying life, and and uh, you know having fun with my grandchildren, like an old pappy. You know? That's the way it should be. Yeah, and I, I I have a 38 year old son who hustled like I did at 38, and when it's all said and done, he'll pick up where I leave off. Nice, very nice, yeah. very nice well, life I have. I, per, okay, I I, I want to apologize. I, I perhaps misspoke because you do post a lot of stuff about eBay. Do you run just a series of auctions, or do you have an actual a full blown eBay shop? I might be mistaken. Yeah. It's a, it's a full-blown eBay store. I don't auction nothing. Everything is buy it now. But I have a system, and, and you guys will dig this. If you if you want a discount, there's three golden words you need to tell me. One is please, appreciate, and thank you. Yes. I yeah. mean, it, it, if you want to take food out of my mouth, be courteous about it. <laughs> I, that's the way I look at it, and I'll give you anybody a discount if they're just courteous about it. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not gonna hold on to all this stuff forever, but you know, I want to make people happy too. But be nice sure. about it. Sure, absolutely. Don't go on eBay and say I'll give you thirty bucks for this. Well, it's a three hundred dollar item. Of course not. Don't be stupid. Right. Uh, but if you if you're nice about it, and if it's a three hundred dollar item, um, but. I'd appreciate it if you would sell me this for 260 bucks. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Sure, no problem. Be nice about it. That's what the world's missing. People not being nice anymore. Common courtesy and respect. Right. Yes, yes, there it is. Absolutely. Well, so um, What's up for you guys in the future? Well, I mean, we've got... Uh, a lot of good stuff coming up. We've got a uh, two. We're going to have two episodes next week. Uh, our regularly scheduled program, and we're doing a uh, special Thanksgiving episode that'll air. It'll air on the twenty third. Benny, um, I'll, I'll talk as you're usually the one that does our intros. I'll toss it to you. Why don't you tell everybody who our upcoming thanks special Thanksgiving guest is? Yeah, actually, uh, a legendary name in professional wrestling, David Crockett, which, I mean, okay. any anytime you hear, like, certain names Ooh. to me trigger, like, great wrestling memories. The minute right. you hear the name Crockett, yeah. um, that to me, that that's, like, wrestling gold. Absolutely. And Mid-80s. David Crockett, go ahead. 
Mid Atlantic wrestling, man. Yep. Great territory. I mean, have great territory. With without question. And and of course, uh David Crockett is will be making a live appearance here in Virginia December 2nd, which is unheard of. Really, he doesn't do many non Crockett reunion or NWA themed uh, indie shows, but he'll be here in Virginia. We'll talk all about it on the show. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up. Um, so, again, Bud, thank you so much for Thanks, your bud. time. This Appreciate has been great. It. And anybody, like you said, uh, they can find you on eBay. Uh, bud Carson, you know, you have your, your Philly fan, your, your, Sports collectibles, a lot of good wrestling stuff. Um, and so, and like you said, if you want the special discount, just be nice, and right. and you may you may shave a few bucks off just just for manners, right? And and make a yeah. friend in the process. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love my, having friends. Never can have too many friends. That's true. You never have too many. So for Bud Carson, for the player himself, Benny Scala, I'm Dan Spashano. Have a good night, everyone, and we will see you next time we're in the ring.